the Chicago Bulls pick Michael Jordan of the University of North Carolina. So Michael Jordan, who right now is in Bloomington. September 1984. A young rookie by the name of Michael Jordan signs to the Chicago Bulls as the number three pick in the NBA draft. And Iron Maiden released their most ambitious album yet. At this point, Steve Harris and most of the lads in Maiden were in their mid to late 20s and had notched up multiple platinum selling albums in the UK and US, embarking upon numerous sold out world tours. Success can breed complacency, especially for 20 somethings who might find it all too easy to succumb to the temptations and offerings that money and fame bring. Why work hard when you've already made it? It's a question many successful people face. Others, though, want more, and Maiden were definitely in the latter camp. After the World Peace Tour concluded in December of 1983, the band took just three weeks off before heading to New Jersey's Le Chalet Hotel for a six-week songwriting and rehearsing session. This is how Maiden normally goes about songwriting, according to Harris. So, um we have no clue what we're going to write for any album. There are no leftovers, uh, so songs lying around. It'll all be totally fresh and come out of that next designated writing period because we never write on the road. We never come up with a direction for an album. We just write a bunch of stuff and see what comes out. Dickinson told Louder Sound magazine that it was all random. It always is, although no one ever believes me when I say it. I make my lyrics as visual as I can because I think that way. You'll list every lyric when I'm writing it, and truth be told, I sing in pictures too. As I sing, I see the picture in my mind of me standing on the deck of a bloody great boat in rhyme of the ancient mariner or the dogs of war in two minutes to midnight. I, I, I write in my own little world, then bring it forth on the page in the form of a lyric. It was here in New Jersey that most of the album's eight songs were penned, all except for the 13 minute and 45 second epic Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, your narrator's personal favorite Iron Maiden track. The funny thing is, uh, no one actually thought it was 13 minutes long at all. We were all so into, into making it work and we all enjoyed it so much that we thought it was only eight or nine minutes long maximum. The song, inspired by a poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, saw the band reaching new heights when it came to songwriting both lyrically and musically. The album included what would go on to become timeless Maiden classics and live staples such as the fighter pilot inspired Aces High, Two Minutes to Midnight, the self-titled track, and the memorable and hilariously named instrumental Lost for Words. Released on September 14, 1984, the album was another commercial success for the band, hitting number two in the UK number 9 in Germany, and number 21 in the US, where it was again, like previous albums, certified platinum. The success of the album triggered the World Slavery Tour, which would also see Maiden put together perhaps their most ambitious live show up till that point, inspired by the ancient Egyptian artwork of the record sleeve, which, like all of Maiden's album covers up until that point, was designed by Derek Riggs. The stage show featured a larger-than-life Eddie, who took the form of an Egyptian king's statue, before being ripped apart halfway through the show to reveal a 20-foot-high mummified Eddie, reaching out over the band with limbs flailing. It was really something, and it's considered by most Maiden fans to be the best stage production that the band ever put together, at least during the 80s. The band recreated much of this stage show for its 2012 Somewhere Back in Time world tour. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. The World Slavery Tour took in 187 shows across the globe in a 13-month period, and it took its toll on the young band. Bruce Dickinson told Loudwire magazine that he considered quitting. I did think about that, yeah, I was just very, very mentally exhausted by the whole grind. If you like, of grinding out 13 months on the road with no stable social life of any description. Unlike Maiden, Priest took a breath after their Metal Conqueror tour concluded and didn't play a single show throughout 1985, except for three songs at the iconic Live Aid Festival. Fresh from an extended break, it was time to work on the follow-up to Defenders of the Faith, but Rob Halford almost didn't make it. Success got the best of him, 
and he subsisted on a diet of Jack Daniels and cocaine. It wasn't until the band moved their base from the Bahamas to LA that Halford checked into rehab. I came out after 30 days and my life had changed in a million ways. The important part was my ability to understand that music is the most important thing in my life and that I don't need any other chemical influence to do what I need to do. But life was about to throw Halford another curveball. His boyfriend killed himself in front of him. He told Louder Sound. It was with someone who was also dealing with their own self-destructive challenges. That was my pledge in the memory of that person to stay clean and sober. Drug addiction and alcoholism is like a curse, man. Bands ask me about the drink and the drugs and I say, fucking do it. It's a rite of passage. I hope you have a good time with it and I hope it doesn't kill you because it can and it does. Halford has stayed sober ever since, celebrating his 37th year of sobriety at time of recording this episode in 2023. Despite this inauspicious backdrop, Rob and the band soldiered on, and the subsequent work would be one of their most divisive, mostly due to its commercial pop metal sound, which also saw the band introduce synth guitars and drum machines. The lead single, Turbo Lover, albeit a fun song, was a radical departure from the screaming for vengeance of days gone by, and if the music didn't turn Priest Faithful off, many might have been turned off by the lyrics which, while definitely subject to interpretation, have been interpreted by many to be about sexual relations between men. Another song, Reckless, only made it onto the album because Priest rejected the makers of Top Gun from including it in the now iconic film, which was bested only by its sequel 35 years later. KK recalls, and We thought Top Gun was going to be a flop. While Top Gun would go on to gross 357 million US dollars on just a 15 million dollar budget, Turbo wasn't the commercial success Priest thought it'd be. Appealing to the pop metal sensibilities of the day, a time where American glam metal bands like Rat, Poison and Motley Crue's Home Sweet Home dominated the airwaves, Turbo was a departure from its predecessors in that it actually did better in America than in the UK. It hit platinum status in the States after reaching number 17 on the Billboard chart, but back home, it didn't even go gold, and it barely cracked the top 40. As Rob Halford puts it, it's definitely a love it or hate it Priest album. While Priest were touring to support the album, Maiden, fresh from a well-deserved and much-needed four-month break that helped keep Dickinson in the band, regrouped. But during this time, they did release Live After Death, a live album that would go on to be certified platinum in the US, the success of which would inspire numerous heavy metal live albums thereafter. Like Priest, Maiden were to bring a new sound to their subsequent album, thanks to some experimenting the boys had been doing during their break, although the result was still very much an unquestionable heavy metal album, and one that remains underrated to this day, featuring the hit single Wasted Years and the 8.5 minute epic Alexander the Great. Not only were the songs ambitious, but so too was Derek Riggs' cover art and sleeve, which one could sit and interrogate for an hour to notice little things like a sign that read, latest results, West Ham 7, Arsenal 3, much to the chagrin of Gunners fans, or a neon sign that reads, Maggie's Revenge, in reference to the British PM at the time, Margaret Thatcher. It also featured a futuristic looking Eddie, who author Mick Wall described as the mutant offspring of Arnie in The Terminator and one of Doctor Who's Cybermen, a rogue time cop, half alien and half human, armed to his pointy teeth with futuristic weaponry. The album was made as most expensive to make up until that point. Harris remembers. So we went a bit crazy. We recorded the bass and drums down in Essel uh, Compass Point, then went to Holland to Whistle Lord Studios in uh, Hilversum, to do the guitars and vocals, and then Martin took it back to New York to mix it at Electric Lady Studios. Uh, it was crazy, but we were just desperately trying to get it right without hurrying it for uh, change. And well, you learn from your mistakes, I suppose. But it turned out to be worth it, with the album becoming Maiden's most commercially successful up till that point, hitting number two in the UK and number 11 in the US, where it became the first Maiden album to sell more than two million copies. The subsequent tour, cheekily titled Somewhere On Tour, took in 151 shows across the globe and heavily featured inflatable props in the stage show. Dickinson told Louder Sound, This was a 
great inflatable tour. Um, Dave Lights was still doing our lighting stuff and he was well into inflatables. He had a bit of an inflatable megalomia in fact. He built inflatables that were so big they wouldn't actually fit inside the sodding buildings. We had two big hydraulic hands which would raise up, not spinal tap at all, with big eddy claw hands that would inflate. Me and Bruce stood in the palms of the inflatable hands. On one night, a lamp was too close and burnt a hole in it. Uh, consequently, it was like, nice deflating, nice hollow white right plonker being up there like that. But not in that. The best thing about it, the next gig we did, they patched it up. They tied the fingers back so it came out with a middle finger up. That was quite hilarious. Unlike their inflatables though, Maiden's career was anything but deflating. Priest, on the other hand, would come to learn that their best days, commercially at least, were in the rear view mirror. In the next episode of Battle of the Bands, Judas Priest ram it down while Iron Maiden play with madness.